Hello. I come from a time in which the term Hey All Scott here is banned. Cloud gaming has taken over. Millions are better off because of it. Companies are less wasteful with their products. But I want a box with Mario on it, damn it. So we have to stop this! Modern gaming. Something stinks. The cool thing to do when you're 24 is to act 40. Isn't this so much better? Everybody misses the good old days. Just ask Nixon. Man, remember when things were worse? I miss that. You just always look at things from your youth with more affection. Honestly, for anybody saying that this new game is worse than this old game from back in the day because it lacks the magic that one had is that because you played that game as a kid and you always have better memories of it so no matter what this newer one does it'll never be better in your eyes or is it actually because that new thing is of lower quality in some cases yes but no matter where the video game industry goes in the future it's hard for people to evolve their taste and accept that this is just how things are now when the xbox one was initially revealed in 2013 to require an internet connection to function properly guess who was pissed i can't recall a single person defending microsoft here the idea your video game console needed to have an internet connection for single player games was preposterous now it's a footnote what people were once enraged about with video games have slowly evolved into something you just come to expect i mean nintendo once said they thought online multiplayer was a scam downloadable content no and now some of nintendo's games completely depend on online multiplayer and dlc companies change and that's fine new ideas can be scary and when they do come with legitimate downsides it's hard to move on what's next on the chopping block for video games well, corporations hate physical media they want us all to move to digital trying to make physical as less appealing as possible i think they've been spitting in my games they control everything with the digital copy of the game and you can't easily return or trade that in you don't have to produce and ship the games it's everything they've ever wanted in a 400 gigabyte file Yikes! I mean, my god, they've been releasing digital-only consoles with no means of playing discs and they only have this much storage? Games take up so much space and require such powerful hardware that's so expensive and requires a TV. You don't have that with movies. At this point, you just need a TV! So what if I could play a game like a movie on Netflix or play a song on Spotify? I don't download it, I stream it through the internet. It's the perfect idea. I would like to introduce the future of gaming. Game streaming is an obvious step to take. I mean, pretty much all of the forms of entertainment are consumed via streaming, so naturally, Mario's next. I'm not opposed to the future. I'm just scared shitless about it. Gaming isn't like other mediums. It's honestly the most unique, so you can't really take what's happening with movies and music and apply it to video games. It may make sense on paper, but it's way more complicated than that. You can't ask a dog to fit into a cage too small for it, or ask a cat to be perfectly streamable online without any latency or lag. So, what is game streaming? Streaming. You've come to the right place. So you play a video game on your PlayStation 2. That entire game is included on the disc you bought and was built to run on the console's hardware. Makes sense. This is what the guy at Best Buy said. The problem is, as the years go by, the hardware ages more and more. There's more impressive technology being pumped out. And while new games come out for these old systems and they look better than last year's games, that's because the developers were learning how to use the hardware more effectively. But eventually, you just have to upgrade things. You can't keep milking the same five-year-old hardware, which is why we got the PlayStation 3 in the cycle continues. These are all computers at the end of the day. If you pry them open, you'll find, uh, specs. With game streaming, theoretically, you don't have to worry about buying any of this beefy, expensive hardware. All you need is an internet-capable device. Playing these massive, beautiful games requires tons of horsepower. They can't just run on anything. They need to run on some kind of supercomputer, so the image is streamed from more powerful hardware to you over the internet. All of this means you could technically get better graphics than on a console via this method. You don't have to buy the expensive of technology, it's already all bought and being nursed by the company that's streaming it to you. And they can continue to upgrade and fix things as time goes on. You don't need to worry about installations, downloads, patches, these big ass consoles taking up space. It's bringing gaming back to the idea that all you have to do is grab a controller and hit play and the game just starts. It's very much like comparing watching a movie on Netflix to playing it on a DVD. Eventually you have to upgrade to that Blu-ray player. With Netflix, you just find something you want, hit play, and it loads up through the internet, transmitting the video frame by frame frame. You don't have to wait to download the movie, thus having to free space on your hard drive. This is pure convenience. And it's so bad! Game streaming or cloud gaming makes me sick, and if it doesn't make you sick, you're already sick. In reality, it's enticing. If you're a sadist. And that sadism started in 2010. See, game streaming has been in the works for years, but it officially became a full retail product in 2010 with OnLive, a cloud gaming service hell-bent on going bankrupt two years later. Let's test out OnLive. You know, maybe I'm giving cloud gaming a hard time. Maybe it can win me over with silence. OnLive was the first big cloud gaming platform. The technology was a thing before. The company G Cluster debuted a game streaming technology at E3, 2000? What the hell did that look like? 
it's through the net. But On Live was the first major mainstream one. For only 15 bucks a month, you could have the audacity to buy On Live games. Yet to use the cloud gaming service, you had to pay a fee per month, and then also had to buy the games you wanted to play at full price separately. They quickly removed this fee because when you go bankrupt two years later, you gotta act fast. On Live was available on computers, smart devices, and the On Live micro console, which I have here. God, it's so tiny, but it has some heft to it. Don't swallow. The official On Live controller is honestly one of the nicer controllers I've ever used, and I tried out On Live back in the day. I played Saints Row the Third on my white 2010 MacBook. This is it now. So massive props for being the first major cloud gaming platform. Like for 2010, it worked pretty good. It also wasn't very good, but it was 2010, so it was pretty good. They had lots of big games on here. The Batman Arkham series, LA Noir, Just Cause 2, Bioshock, Assassin's Creed. This wasn't just some oops, I sh my pants at GDC and announced on live thing. This was a legitimate service. And from my experience using an underpowered computer on a Wi-Fi connection, it was fairly impressive. You still needed some horsepower to your devices if you wanted the best experience. If you were running this on a smartphone at the time, prepare for the OnLive app was available on mobile, but really only Android. The iPhone and iPad had an OnLive viewer app, which let you browse games and watch others playing games on OnLive, but you couldn't play the games on the device. It's the exact reason why I'm an Apple bitch today. Uh, I don't want to be overwhelmed with options. I would say OnLive was ahead of its time. For the era in which it was released, I stand by working quite well and having more than enough support behind it. In fact, I think it was comparable to, and in some cases, better than cloud gaming services we see today. But all employees at the company were laid off in 2012, and while the service remained operational, by 2015, it ended with Sony acquiring most of OnLive's assets. You know, Sony also acquired the cloud gaming company Gaikai. They offered demos of full console games streamed via web browsers. And after Sony bought them up in 2012, I think it's fair to expect they had something cooking. I'm pleased to announce the new streaming game service, PlayStation Now. Oh God, it talks. PlayStation Now. Now, Sony's answer to manslaughter. You know, PlayStation Now has been a thing ever since January 2014, and I think after I tried it out here, it finally reached a record one user. When the service initially launched, it cost roughly 15 to 20 bones a month based on your subscription plan. And on top of that, you still had to pay for the games and they were all just rentals. Oh, I'm not paying enough to be f PlayStation Now was sort of Sony's way of getting around the lack of PlayStation 3 compatibility with the PlayStation 4, as PS3 games were and still are the main titles offered on the service. PlayStation Now was also available on other Sony devices like the PlayStation Vita and PlayStation 3, so I believe that's enough for it to be considered famine. Finally, I can play PS3 games on my PS3 for only $2! for four hours of playtime. Yes, PlayStation Now was game streaming, but launched with a rental model. The pricing varied amongst games. Some offered the two for four hour deal. This is the best we can do, okay, time is money. Of course, you could opt for the six for seven day option. I needed some good math today. Eight for 30 days or 15 for 90 days. For Uncharted 2, it would be cheaper to buy seven copies of the disc. But that pricing wasn't even a standard. Some games were even more expensive, effectively doubling the usual prices. Why wasn't there an option to just buy the game? Why do this whole rental nonsense? Why was it so expensive? It was cheaper with OnLive. If anything, it would have made more sense if the small startup company's prices were more expensive and the big conglomerate could cut a deal. What's the premium being paid for here? Like, what happens when I stream a game? PlayStation Now was initially a huge bust, but as the years went on, it took on a new life as a better service. For only $60 a year, you get access to all games on the service, no rentals, no need to purchase the games individually, one fee, you get everything. The service still focuses on PlayStation 3 games, but there are a few PS2 and PS4 games available. With these, you can actually download to your system and play without streaming. It's a really great way to play games you're ashamed to outright purchase. I mean, half of the problems with playing Sonic Forces is owning it. But all of these games are available to stream. The PS3 games are only available to stream, so let's give that a try. Okay, pretty good. So here's the thing. My internet connection is okay. I think I'm officially the only person to not say it's either really good or really bad. It's like when the 3DS XL came out, every single review had to brag about how big their hands were. This system is so much better because I have really big hands. Fuck me. But PlayStation now streaming, it works. It's not perfect. If you're actively looking for problems, you'll find them. Looking at the picture quality, you'll notice it's not as good as playing the game off the actual system. Frame drops, glitches, they happen. But a lot of the time, I sort of forget I'm streaming the game. You just get kind of sucked in and play the game because that's what you're doing. You're playing a video game. Of course, streaming introduces lag. You're receiving an internet signal and then your controller has to send a command back to the console through Bluetooth, then through the internet, and then the internet has to respond to your input by displaying it within the game. And that's just hitting the jump button. There's gonna be some lag, but with 
most of the games available on here, you don't need pinpoint precision. Most. I'm a Pac-Man Championship Edition 2 nut. I know what I'm talking about here. This is an incredibly fast-paced game that needs split-second reactions, and when it gets towards the end of a run, I found it painfully difficult to make turns while streaming. Oh, well, that's PlayStation Now. It can't play Pac-Man. Nobody else with technology from 1840 can. I think my biggest issue with PlayStation Now, though, is that it's still pretty clunky. Now is described as games on demand. Give demand a second. It's not that bad, but PS4 games take a while to load. Playing a game boots you out of the PS Now app and it appears on your home screen like you bought it. In fact, for every single game I played, I get an email thanking me for my purchase. It thinks I purchased all of these games. They always say zero dollars. Sony, give it up. I'm not replying. The game selection is quite good though. You get so many of the PS3's best and games from the PS4 that come in and out of being available. The service has definitely improved over time, but man, when streaming is supposed to be about convenience, PlayStation Now has too many quirks for it to be a legitimate part of the conversation. It doesn't work well for all types of games, it takes a while to load, and then when you're in the game itself, the quality is unpredictable, it depends on how your internet's feeling that day. The only reason why you'd prefer streaming compared to just downloading is to play these games on PC, where PlayStation Now is also available, playing PS3 games, which I'll just throw it out there, if you want to play a lot of PS3 games, I might have found the perfect device. Or if you want to save hard drive space playing PS4 games, why waste 40 gigabytes downloading Neo when you can stream it? Because streaming's for bitches, all right? If you own any console from the past decade, you're pretty used to the idea of deleting files to make room for new games at this point. It doesn't matter anymore. Is it saving space? Yeah, that's a feature for most game consoles now. Well, at least we have NVIDIA GeForce Now. Finally, a cloud gaming service with a name for the masses. My mom asked me how the latency was on this. This is an NVIDIA Shield TV. It's a tiny box you buy to watch Netflix. Now, why would you buy this tiny box compared to this tiny box? If you're one of those that refuse to buy anything with less than three gigs of RAM. No. Pretty solid user experience on this thing. I mean, its main purpose is to be used for Netflix and Hulu, but if you want to play games, there are some mobile games adapted for use with the TV, but there's GeForce Now games. Oh my god, look at all these things. These are some huge names. You know what? I'm going to try No Man's Sky, but first I have to join GeForce Now and create an account. All right, so I create an account off screen and log in here. Okay, I need a gamepad and NVIDIA is f***ing terrified of my internet connection and I also have to perform a system update. No worries, no worries. Let's do that and try connecting an Xbox controller to the Shield TV for 35 minutes. Boom, found it. Can control the entire Shield TV with an Xbox controller. This is the happiest I've been in 35 minutes. Hey, let's try something like Fortnite. That game being streamable is a match made in heaven. It's incredibly popular and having it streamed and playable on any device, that's a no-brainer. Let's try again. Let's try again harder. Okay, I might have been logged out after updating. Let me log back into my GeForce Now account. Back to the game selection. You know what? Rocket League. That's a fun game. I have my gamepad. I'm logged in. Let's do it. Okay, so all these games aren't available on GeForce Now like PlayStation Now. GeForce is allowing me to play my Steam library or Epic Games library or whatever on my Shield TV or other devices using cloud technology. So these are basically games on Steam that support GeForce Now. So you log into GeForce Now, then into your Steam account, and you can then stream games that you own on Steam that support GeForce Now. Okay, well for Rocket League, it looks like I need an Epic Games account. Thankfully, I can sign up via the Shield TV using my Xbox controller to control the mouse. I sign up for the account and get a verification code in my inbox. I try to enter it. The screen is frozen, so I try to sign up for an Epic Games account on my laptop, add Rocket League to my library on my laptop, then sign into the account on the Shield TV to access it. I sign in, play Spot the Boat. And that's GeForce Now. Uh, keep in mind, I use Apple products, so I'm a fucking idiot. Streaming is supposed to be easier than not streaming. I don't want to log into seven different accounts to do any of this. And keep in mind, it's not just Steam and Epic Games tiles. I mean, we have Origin, Uplay. I mean, I'll do anything Uplay does. But still, basically, GeForce Now is to play PC games via the cloud. They're not GeForce Now games. They're PC games using GeForce Now technology to be streamed. The point of having games like Fortnite or Rocket League on a streaming service is so then these free-to-play games are immediately accessible, which is what the developers want. They're free after. After all, especially with this service being available on a set-top box, like people buying these types of products probably don't have a PlayStation or Xbox. Why would you buy this to stream Netflix if you already have those? So for people like them who aren't super hardcore, why the hell would they do all of this? If they wanted to play Rocket League, just buy a damn Xbox. It's the same price. This is definitely more for a PC gamer. Somebody would like to play some of their library on a TV or a mobile device if they so please. But oh my God, for me, this is not worth the headache. And I did a lot of research on this. Well, here's hoping Google Stadia will save the day. So Google doesn't know anything about video games. This will be fun to watch. Though they do have some of the most advanced internet-based technologies or technologies in general out there. If anybody can make cloud gaming viable, it's them. Premiere Edition. What? 
this includes the only two things you can use. What's an addition to Google Stadia about this? What could they possibly add or remove from this package to make it a different addition? Without the controller, it's just a Google Chromecast. Without the Chromecast, it's just the controller. The Google Stadia <laughs> controller. See, there's almost never anything unique about controllers made by companies outside of the main ones. Like, let's take the Xbox and PlayStation controllers and mash them together. Whenever you see a company do this, be afraid. It's a fine controller, it's just, who gives a shit? A Google Chromecast Ultra is included, which is how we're playing this on a TV. You just have to plug it in here and watch it dangle. Setting up Stadia is pretty simple and we're into the action pretty soon. We're pretty tethered to a smartphone app though. You can't browse the games on the store or on the TV. We have to use the smartphone to look through games and add to our library. Oh man, it's just so much simpler this way. So streaming the games, it works quite well, in fact. Everything loads up quick enough, and while I'm in the game, things work pretty well. It's not always going to be flawless, but I do truly forget what I'm playing is through the internet, and it just feels like an actual game console. Hey, I played the Switch enough to not care about resolution as much as others, and the second Nomad, so I don't really care if it goes down to 1079p. What I do care about are the games playable. One thing I've noticed, if you want to get into cloud gaming, you better love Assassin's Creed. If you want to play Ubisoft games and very little else, Sure, the selection just isn't varied enough. You did get a couple of big new releases, but it's never been enough to make Stadia <laughs> your go-to platform. It can't be. There's barely any exclusives, and the ones they have, Pac-Man Mega Tunnel Battle? This kind of stuff gets me off and I don't care. You can sign up for a pro subscription. The basic service doesn't usually cost money. You just have to pay for the games. A pro subscription for $9.99 a month gets you the best quality streaming possible, exclusive discounts, and free games available, of which there's a decent enough selection to warrant jumping in on pro. So here's the thing about Google Stadia. I'm out of fluids. I think people give it a hard time because it's stupid, but it's not a bad product. It's just a horrible service. They gave up on it just about a year into its inception. The game lineup is pitiful and it's pretty much the same as every other cloud gaming platform. Oh look, Assassin's Creed and Tomb Raider. We get it. They put other games on here, classic games, modern games, just something other than what Ubisoft is doing. Most of these are games from a couple of years ago and they just aren't exciting. But like if those games release on the Nintendo Switch or something, there's a reason why people want to play it there because it'll be a new experience playing portably. It's just not the same on Stadia, but you can play it portably. You just need a specific type of phone with a great internet connection and a controller, preferably. Look at these two people. They're playing console games portably. Which one would you trust with your life? When you have to jump through so many hoops to do such a thing, the magic is lost. And Google has shown they don't understand video games. They may think they do, but at the end of the day, the tech industry and video game industry are much more different than these companies think. So bring in Amazon. They're just as bad as Google. They have a lot of money and nobody to love. Amazon Luna is their cloud gaming service. Remember when they were trying to break into gaming with their Fire TV set-top box and they made this whole ass controller for it. The only things available were mobile games blown up for the TV, so I think they know what they're doing here. You know, the selection here is quite a lot better than Google Stadia's. Having more than Assassin's Creed will do that to you. There's tons of variety, and the streaming quality is very much on par with Google's. Now, that variety comes at a cost. I think Amazon said, we need a baseball game. MLB The Show isn't returning our calls? Uh, uh, sure! But just the fact that for $5.99 a month compared to Stadia Pro's $9.99 a month, I get the best quality streaming and way more games for free. I mean, you can play all these instantly, no purchase, no adding them to your library with a smartphone. This is way more in line with what you think of when Netflix for games comes up. Except Netflix doesn't have a separate subscription for Ubisoft's games. I mean, this still isn't amazing, but I prefer what I'm seeing here to Google. But if you want an all-in-one experience, Xbox Cloud Gaming. Microsoft's chipped away at perfecting cloud gaming for years, and to have them integrate it with their huge library of games via their own IPs and Xbox Game Pass, this is insanely impressive. And that's what a lot of these cloud gaming operations are. Impressive, but they just get enough wrong to make them f***ing putrid. So here's the thing, game streaming makes sense, and I think it's ridiculous to act like buying a game and immediately being able to play without a download isn't convenient and neat. But there's always so many things that just run me the wrong way about this kind of stuff. First and foremost, it's longevity. I mean, look at OnLive, that thing is gone as f with not being able to download these games or just not having a physical option, when these services are down, they're down. And when they permanently go down, they're gone forever. Yeah, being able to play without downloading isn't nice. But if downloading is really that big of an issue for you and your download speeds are that bad, how do you have internet fast enough for game streaming? And the games are just never there. All of these services go after run-of-the-mill Ubisoft games and like... 
I don't care! The benefits that come with cloud gaming often are outweighed by the negatives. It's unreliable, the game selection's not there, and if you think it doesn't feel like you own digital games, try streamed games. I feel like I'm at a demo kiosk playing these things. And I just feel like video games don't lend themselves as much to the streaming subscription model as much as movies and music do. With those, they're quicker experiences. You just want instant access to whatever, whenever. You're randomly like, let's watch a movie, or look up this song. Games are a huge commitment. They can be hundreds of hours long. You aren't really gonna sit down and play 20 games in a row. You're usually gonna pick one game to sit down and play, and that's your game for the weekend. So why does it matter that you can pull these games up fast like YouTube videos? Uh, playing on your phone thing, it's just too clunky for me to really take it into consideration or take it seriously. Like, you need to have a blazing fast internet connection on the go, and then preferably a controller and a phone mount. And at that point, just get a portable game console. Like, is lugging this around with your phone that much less convenient than lugging this around? Cloud gaming has taken the form of a bunch of tech companies that like to act like they know what they're doing with video games, pumping loads of money into this thing they'll abandon within five years. I'm open to an all digital future. I mean, I prefer how things are now with physical games, but I'm not gonna resist it. I've accepted that this is how the future is looking. And cloud gaming has a ton of potential as a supplement to regular gaming, because I will be damned if my next game console is a skin tag. Hey y'all, Scott here. Dumb. A product for those who hate owning products. What could that be? Well, I would show you, but I don't own one. I hate owning products. We're living in a world that's been consumed by digital goods and subscription models. Nearly every form of entertainment can be enjoyed via the internet. There's no need for DVD collections or a CD binder in the car because that's just dangerous. Over the past two decades, we've seen a lot change. Going from CDs to music downloads to music streaming to sitting in silence. This is how most consumers prefer their media, without atoms. And gaming has been slowly but surely heading in this direction as well, though it's much more difficult. Have you ever tried downloading a whole video game? Of course not. By the time it's finished, you're dead. These files are so damn big that not only does it take forever to download them, they fill up your console storage immediately. Only after a few games do you have to start dieting. Oh, maybe just this once. That's why physical video games will remain relevant for the foreseeable future. Like, come on, this is great. But there are some benefits to digital, uh, one being more space for my feet. Plus, video game companies love it. You can't resell your game. Refunding is much harder to do. They don't have to ship the game to retailers. They make far more money from a digital purchase than a physical one. So let's do it. Let's create a console that can't even try to play physical games. What, did they just shove gum in there? Digital only video game consoles, Satan's latest party trick. So what's the deal with these? Why do they exist? Well, digital only consoles have been around longer than you may think. Zebo anyone? Yeah, I own a Zebo because what was I gonna do? Not. A budget Brazilian console that only played digital games from a wide variety of big name publishers, mind you. These were mostly ports of mobile phone games, so it's not like we were missing out on much with 2009's digital only console spectacular. Wow, Resident Evil 4 FIFA Crash Nitro Kart? What the hell is that? Hey, I'm not sure if this counts anymore. However, I think this was an important step because later that year, Sony took the plunge way earlier than they had any right to with the PSP Go. The PSP had a few criticisms lobbied against it. For one, it was functional and the PSP Go fixed that. Okay, so this was combining the popularity of smartphones and slider phones. Smartphones because it's digital only, you download everything. In 2009, I mean, those smartphone apps were tiny in size, so they could download fairly quick. PSP games were hundreds of megabytes or a couple gigabytes, which I know may not seem like a lot these days, but inflation's a bitch. Back in 2009, this would take four ever to download. It was truly ahead of its time in all the wrong ways. While releasing a digital only console five years into a system's lifespan doesn't seem too awful crazy these days, it was back then. Customers were confused, I know I was. I didn't even realize this was digital only back then. I just thought that's how PSPs look now, but frankly, could you really blame me? The fact it was digital only always felt like a footnote. The subtitle Go kind of put it in the same league as something like a Game Boy Micro to me, just a smaller version. But if you are willing to go all digital for the sake of portability, the PSP Go does have a pretty slick design. Closed, it's roughly the same size as an old iPod Touch, so at least you have a reason to go all digital. Because the original PSP, man, putting that in your jeans, it would easily give you what I refer to as PSP leg. What's wrong with him? He's playing Daxter. Now, one of the defining 
use about the PSP was the memory cards, no onboard storage, instead expensive as all held dinky ass sticks. 32 megabytes? I've sneezed bigger stuff than that. Well as the PSP Go comes with 16 gigabytes of onboard storage, more than any other Sony Portable has ever shipped with which is very sad. But when you're a digital only console, I can't help but think this is also pathetic. Hey, 2009 was a different time. 16 gigabytes of storage was a lot and flash storage at that, much more expensive than a standard hard drive. But the PSP Go was already pretty damn expensive and when 16 gigabytes of storage is all you're getting and when you fill that up, you can't get any more games until you delete some or buy a memory card that's also damn expensive. It's just a situation where I go, just give me the regular PSP for Christ's sake. It just flat out didn't make sense to go with this compared to the normal version. It's not like Sony discontinued the regular PSP, you could still buy it, and for far cheaper, also meaning literally every PSP game would work on it. Not all PSP games were available on the digital PlayStation Store, so with this model, you could play everything while also going all digital if you really wanted to. This one had a neat little slide mechanism that could wear out over time, but couldn't play all PSP games and was more expensive. Two years later, the PSP Go was more so a cute little fuck up rather than something that pissed me off. It didn't feel like Sony was going all digital with this one just to make more money via the PlayStation Store. It more so felt they were saying, I have an idea on how to make the PSP better. We don't. Doing a digital only console wasn't as scary as it is today. Back then, there wasn't as big of a threat that physical media was going away forever, so this just seemed like something to point and laugh at. Damn it. In the coming years, digital media was rapidly starting to take over. I mean, the major consoles all started to offer their big budget retail games day and date digitally. Hell, sometimes they'd launch earlier that way. Wind Waker HD on the Wii U launched digitally first. Sony and Microsoft would start giving away digital copies of retail games for free via PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live Gold around this time. And you know what they were doing? They were prepping us. This wasn't just some act of kindness. They were trying to weasel AAA digital games into our lives so we'd accept them more and more. Or that's just what I've been writing on the walls. Over the course of the next decade, these companies continued to push digital content more and more until that fateful day when Microsoft took the leap. The Xbox One S All Digital Edition. Okay, so what? Is this gonna be like how the PSP Go was a radically redesigned PSP? Is this gonna be the smallest Xbox yet? Hey everybody, I have an Xbox One S All Digital Edition. Okay, disc-free gaming, like this is some kind of innovative new feature. Oh, finally, I was about to pass out. This launched on May 7th, 2019 for $249.99, which was $50 less than a normal Xbox One S, but it was $50 less than the MSRP. You could very easily find these systems for roughly $200 at this point. I mean, this iteration of the Xbox One launched in 2016. It was like they announced this a few months after Black Friday 2018, where you could get this system for $200 with a game included. GameStop refused to sell the all-digital edition because they ain't making money on that. Most of their revenue comes from used game sales. Selling this would be cutting off part of the food chain, i.e. the ability to buy Agents of Mayhem for a dollar, and you know what happens then? Nothing I want to live through. So Xbox One Sad, as many call it, was positioned as just another option, said Microsoft. Yes, another option, which includes significantly less options. I get a portable system having a digital-only alternative to cut down on the size, but this is quite literally an Xbox One S with the disc slot spackled. And with it being a newer version of a three-year-old version of a console that originally launched six years prior, this wasn't going to go on sale, at least around the time of its release. The regular One S, even with the digital edition out, you could find it consistently for under 250 So, what'll it be? Listen, I get it. If you own an Xbox One system, eventually, it got to the point where physical media just wasn't as lucrative to buy. Xbox Game Pass was introduced in 2017, a subscription service allowing Xbox users to download as many games that were available. Just one fee per month and all these games are yours to play, with first party exclusives being a part of this all starting in 2018. If you had Xbox Game Pass, you didn't need to go out and buy Gears 5 at launch. You could just download it right there at no extra cost, which is why a physical copy of Gears 5 feels wrong. So for a while, I didn't buy a physical Xbox game in years. Those joints were getting rusty. So this at least made some sense, but if you're gonna do this, make it more enticing than just removing an integral feature to knock 50 bucks off the price. You can't play DVDs and Blu-rays, music CDs, any physical games, which means you'd either pray they're available on Game Pass or check the store for inflated prices. Which is why something like they've been doing this generation is... better? Thanks for not stabbing me. The Xbox Series S, the console for those who just 
don't give a f so Microsoft launched their fourth generation of Xbox consoles, headlined by the Xbox Series X, the true next-gen Xbox. But what if you only kinda want a new Xbox? Well, right alongside it came the Xbox Series S, so not only is this a digital-only system with no disc slot, but it's less powerful as well. Sounds great! All adding up to a console that costs $200 less than the Series X. All right, bravo for giving a much more legitimate reason to buy this, and plus the design is entirely different. That means bad. I mean, it's perfectly serviceable. I just never understood this giant mole. I wanna get that checked out. I always really like the air vents on the Xbox One S look. Here they went for the speaker grill look because well, there is no way you're mistaking this for an Xbox Series X. These don't even look like they're from the same planet, let alone the same product line. But the Xbox Series S does a solid job giving, in quotes, next gen performance at last gen prices. The processor is only four teraflops compared to the Series X's 12. Oh, unplayable! But everything is still buttery smooth and opens lightning quick on here. It's the perfect console for people who buy FIFA, Call of Duty, and condoms. Though, 512 gigabytes of onboard storage, of which 148 is taken up by the operating system. So, that means you can store, I don't know, two Call of Duty games? This is one of the biggest problems with these types of systems. They want you to buy these consoles, but they don't give you enough storage. How am I supposed to go all digital when 90% of my time is gonna be spent managing my files? You can always buy an Xbox memory card to upgrade your storage amount. Uh, see if I wanna get one terabyte, that only costs just buy a Series X. The PlayStation 5 similarly launched alongside a PlayStation 5 Digital Edition. Many have pointed this out already, but it does very much seem like Sony originally developed the PS5 Digital Edition first. This looks much more natural compared to the standard disc-based version. This one is only $100 less expensive than the standard PS5. Oh I understand everybody's financial situation is different, but if you can afford a $400 console, I assume you can wait just a little longer to afford a $500 one. At least the Xbox Series S was less expensive by a far larger amount, an amount much more deal-breaking. But even then, you're not saving money with these. 99% of the time, you will get a better deal buying a physical game compared to its digital counterpart. You can buy a used, different stores have different prices, different sales. The, the fact is, Mass Effect Andromeda is $1 at GameStop and only available via the EA Play subscription service on Xbox digitally. If you had a regular Xbox, you could just buy that game for a dollar, but with the digital only one, your only option would be to get EA Play. So who wins here? Nobody. Even if you only buy digital games, why limit yourself? You can only buy digital games if you want to with a disc-based PlayStation or Xbox console. That 100 or 200 you're saving buying them in comparison to the standard versions, that's not going to last. Because all those games you buy digitally, you can find cheaper elsewhere physically. But this isn't really supposed to be a debate about physical versus digital games. I actually prefer digital in some ways, but I will always favor it being another option rather than a replacement. So I totally understand why, even if physically you could get a game cheaper, you'd rather go digital. You don't wanna deal with clutter, I get that. But why block yourself off from ever having the option playing a physical game? If these digital only consoles gave you the option to purchase a disk drive accessory you could plug into the USB port, fine, I get it. I think they could sell a lot more Series S's and PS5 digitals that way, but no, I don't want options, thank you very much. I want options. I know how it is. Companies will stop at nothing to rip you off, but mask it as a deal. Want to save money? Well, just don't buy a PS5. Hey y'all, Scott here. You know, the world's a much better place without things. Equity is the worst. I don't want the responsibilities that come with owning a door but I sure do miss the perks of it. So I bought just a doorknob to put on my shelf. May not do much, but it reminds me what it's like to have purpose. Why? I like boxes, I got nothing better to do. But they are my only hobby. I also love physical games inside them. I'm half pissed. Physical video games are hard to make. I mean, I couldn't do it. This is the best I could do. Which is why they've always been and will always be special. If you officially release a game on a video game console on a disc or cartridge, it feels like you've made it. They don't just let anybody do that sometimes. We live in a digital age now. It's become uncool to hold things. But for those with a soul, physical media is still out there and the digital age makes physical that much more special. You're telling me when that game publisher could just spit this out on digital stores and call it a day, they went to all the trouble of using plastic Plastic. Obviously, digital is more convenient and the way of the future, but I think physical has enough advantages over it where it makes it hard for it to completely take over, especially with games. With physical media, you can sell that in stores more organically, and I've done some research stores like that. Target enjoys the concept that they sell you a game console which you keep buying games for at Target. At least that's what I've gathered. Sure, they sell digital codes in the stores, but 
I don't really get it. Little game download cards like this don't even have the codes on the cards themselves. They print them on your receipt, so if you get a download card as a gift for somebody, you have to include these both, which is frankly just clunky paper use. That's the only scenario these make sense in, as gifts. Because if you have a gift card to a store and want a digital game, why not just buy an eShop card for funds? So that's another reason physical makes sense. Gifts. It's way more fun to open this as a gift compared to this. Digital codes just aren't exciting. Couple that with the fact that going digital only means you're gonna fill up your console storage capacity faster than if you have a sex wall. Downloading games takes a while. It requires internet, a lot of storage space, and it's just not as fun. It's an adventure to buy a physical game. I fell on the way to the shop. That's a story to tell. Downloading a game, I still felt, and that's just embarrassing. However, it is a lot more convenient, and with consoles becoming faster at loading up titles, it makes digital a lot more enticing. Back on the Wii U, can you tell why it didn't go all digital? So digital has its advantages, like a vasectomy. But games are so large, they take forever to download, you kind of almost need a physical option. These aren't like movies or music. These things can be hundreds of gigabytes in size and are too complicated to stream as easily as other mediums. Plus, digital games, if they get yanked off online storefronts, they're a goner. It's hard to preserve these things. With physical, these issues aren't nearly as prevalent or they're completely non-existent. But man, printing those physical games can cost a lot for a company, especially compared to just putting it out digitally. You have to be fairly confident the physical copy will sell well to warrant a release like this. It usually boils down to the cost of printing the disc or manufacturing the cartridges. So, you don't want to take the risks of releasing a physical game, but still want a presence at retail and satiate customers who want something physical. NOBODY WINS! Except for Satan. A cheap alternative to releasing physical games, some companies have discovered, is what I call a digital-only physical game. It comes in a box, you get artwork, the console branding, the whole nine yards. Everything you'd expect from a physical release except the physical release. Instead of a disc or cartridge, you get a download code because I really needed 16 more characters in my life. Once you redeem the download code, why do I own this? This is pointless. It's like the companies that are releasing these things are going, oh, well, this is good enough. If people who want physical versions of our games, they're too fucking stupid to realize that we're taking the easy way out. And besides, all they want is the box anyways. Yeah, maybe a dumb bitch who overly values packaging. I get overjoyed when there's a random blank piece of paper included in the box. But you see, I may enjoy the box, but when there's nothing inside the box, what's there to enjoy about the box? God! This is one of the stupidest trends of modern gaming, and this isn't only like a three game deal or something. I didn't see one game do this and start proclaiming the truth. No. Look at all these! It's more than three! The first game I can recall doing this was DuckTales Remastered. Well, it was digital only at launch, Capcom released this boxed version only on PS3, and it didn't even come with a disc! You got an exclusive pin and a cardboard disc, so why am I bitching? This was a weird release considering this digital copy only box was exclusive to PlayStation 3. The game came out for 360 and Wii U alongside that console, so why they made this retail edition that didn't even come with a disc exclusive to one console is beyond me. I will say though, at least putting a cardboard disc in here, that's kind of cute. The pen originally came on it, though I think it would have made more sense if the digital code was printed on it. That way, I mean, the game would be on a disc. But I think what makes this really stand apart from the rest is the fact that it did get a physical disc release and they announced it a month after the game released digitally. And it's for all platforms too and the box is basically the same as the original digital only copy. I guess Capcom wasn't optimistic about the game's potential sales and then immediately afterwards they went fucking oops. But if you weren't optimistic about the sales, why even do the digital only physical to begin with? Like really, if you were worried that the game wasn't going to sell well at retail, why would you release a pointless box copy that has less value than a standard release. Oh wait, it comes with a pin. Nintendo did a similar thing with Mario vs. Donkey Kong tipping stars, those bastards! So this game released simultaneously on Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. I remember many saying this was their big cross-buy experiment. So you only on Nintendo platforms do you have the luxury of buying Super Mario Brothers nine times. Over on the PlayStation console, Sony was offering loads of games you buy once and you can play on your PS3, PS4, Vita free of charge. Sometimes they weren't even legacy titles, but Damn it, I chose to buy Clue Clue Land twice. It was just odd that Nintendo had two systems getting NES and SNES games released on them at the same time, both on storefronts called the Nintendo eShop, yet buying Mario 3 on Wii U meant you still had to buy Mario 3 on 3DS. This Mario vs. Donkey Kong game worked across both systems, so Nintendo tried this method where if you bought one version, you'd get a download code for the other. Yeah, even though this was a modern idea, it still had that classic Nintendo stank. You'd expect to just buy it on Wii U, then go to your 3DS and be able to download it from the eShop with your account, but no. They love these download codes so much they decided to celebrate them with a box copy. Over in Europe, digital-only physical copies were released for both Wii U and 3DS. What a waste! So these boxes just contain a download code for said system? 
then after redeeming said download code, you get a download code for the other system. But why not just have both download codes in the box? That way you could just release the 3DS case with the download codes, or the Wii U case with the download codes. Not both. Instead, they released both Wii U and 3DS versions of the digital only boxes where both basically contained the same two games, even though the Wii U case uses up much more plastic and space. Like, not only is that a ways doing that to begin with, but they did it in the most wasteful way imaginable. It's weird because Japan got physical versions of this game. You get the disc or cartridge and the download code for the other console. So Japan was apparently the one market Nintendo felt confident releasing a physical copy of this game in. North America, we only got the game digitally, so they thought there was not a single American who wants to feel this thing. And Europe? Well, let's just assume they f***ing hate Europe. If they just didn't print physical copies in general, I would understand. But they went to the trouble of printing discs and cartridges in Japan, but Europe? They felt confident enough to use game boxes, print cover art, create all these download code slips, ship them out on trucks, take up shelf space in stores, but not print the game on cartridges. Too far. During this generation, a hot trend was the episodic releases of games, spearheaded by Telltale. You just put out the first episode of a game, then finish it throughout the year. Of course, they wanted a retail present, so usually around the time the first episodes of their game released, a physical copy came out as well. He's confused me at the time. They didn't say episode one or anything. It was just, yeah, the game, the full series. I'd see these in the store and think, isn't this game ongoing? Isn't it not finished yet? But in fine print, it's clarified. This is a season pass disc. While it is a physical game, the disc only includes the first episode and grants you access to download the rest of the episodes as they become available. I think what annoys me about releases like this is, man, what's the point of a physical release when you have to download so much of it? Like, yeah, it's still on a disc, but barely. Is the disc really worth it at that point? You have to download four fifths of the rest of the game. That's a lot of hard drive space that's gonna be taken up by this game and you still have to get up to put the disc in. At that point, it's taking up that much storage space. Why not just download the whole game? I almost feel like the download code in the box would have made more sense sense for games like these, at least for when they're not finished yet. But no, they did releases like this to almost fool people walking through a GameStop into going, wow, a new Batman game? And they buy this not reading the fact that it's only one fifth of the game, or if it's after the game finished, only one fifth of the game is on the disc and they have to download the rest. Because with digital only physical games, you have to make sure the consumer knows what they're getting into. What if they don't have internet, but love buying Laura Croft in the Temple of Osiris? There's gotta be somebody out there. Why does Square Enix decide, okay, this game is good enough to get a box, but not a disc? Of course, lots of business decisions go into this kind of stuff. There's gotta be more explanations other than, we didn't want to invest in printing discs for this game. Because while that is a fair reason, it's pretty expensive to do that. Seeing the hundreds of games that get physical releases that truly don't deserve anything more than a face made about them, even by Square Enix themselves, why does something like this warrant a disc? But this doesn't. Is there some kind of totem pull of deservedness where the Temple of Osiris reaches the box and artwork but nothing else tier? You obviously believe this game would sell in a retail environment by releasing this, so why do this? They like to make these releases more enticing with bonuses, a poster, pin, all that. But that makes me question it even more! You're willing to do all this but not print a disc? The Sonic Mania Collector's Edition. Jesus. I measured, this thing is in fact huge. Comes with a Sonic statue, a fake Genesis cartridge with a gold ring inside, a metallic card, and a download code. You gotta be f***ing kidding me. All of this! And no disc, no game card, no case. This is a big collector's edition, and it wasn't like exclusive to Sega's online shop or anything, not exclusive to a single platform like DuckTales. No, I saw Xbox One versions of these things rotting in Best Buys. That is a problem you wouldn't have if you just did a regular release! Now, Sonic Mania did get a physical version one year later, which kind of makes this release a whole lot stupider. I mean, it's a nice collector's edition, but being digital only is just so dumb. You could make the argument it's to make collectors double dip. We're gonna put up the collector's edition and include only a download code. Then we'll do a physical release afterwards. I see a lot of studios do this. The physical release happens after the digital one's been out a while. Get everybody to buy the digital, then the physical releases, and even if the collectors bought the digital version, they just can't help themselves. There needs to be a hotline for this kind of thing. That's fair. It's a smart business practice. Might not be the most ethical in the world, but hey, I fall for it every time and I know exactly what they're doing, which doesn't mean I fall for it. Just means I'm a bitch. Pretty much with all these, I see no point to them. I feel like they raise more questions than answers. Especially the mini Xbox One download code boxes. Little key ring sized plastic boxes containing nothing but a download code and will eventually be the main source of ocean pollution. They are the cutest possible way to kill a seal. But I've saved the most notorious example for last. Ladies and gentlemen, the horror. It's a joke book. 
that's really morbid. The Nintendo Switch is a leader of bullshit in this category due to having such proprietary game cartridges, releasing bigger games physically on Switch is a challenge for developers and publishers. These little guys cost more to produce than just a regular Blu-ray disc, and that cost increases if the game's file size is bigger. I mean, they got one gigabyte cards, two gigabyte, four, eight, 16, 32 is pretty much the max, and that is incredibly pricey. The problem is game sizes right now, how much is that in square feet? A lot of games just straight up won't fit on a Switch cartridge, even the biggest possible ones. So that's why many games are just flat out digital only on the system, even games that would normally have a retail presence. But some publishers just can't help themselves. Enter Capcom. Mega Man Legacy Collection 1 and 2 were both releasing on Nintendo Switch on the same day, both as separate releases. They both got physical copies for other platforms. Surely the Switch will succumb to a similar fit. <laughs> I'm still pissed. Capcom decided to bundle both games together for a physical release, but in doing that, only Legacy Collection 1 was on the cart, 2 you had to download. What made it worse is that this little fact almost forced them to plaster this giant banner at the top saying, don't buy me. This was the box art that was shown off when the bundle was first announced, but thankfully the official release got rid of it, only containing this little blurb on the bottom. It's still pretty lame, it's just, you can't tell me both of these games wouldn't fit on a single cartridge. They're Mega Man games, low calorie. Now Legacy Collection 1 is under 400 megabytes in size, with two being around 3.2 gigabytes. So they obviously would have fit both on a four gigabyte cartridge, but why do that when you can cheap out with the one gig? Also, thanks Capcom for forcing me to download the bigger game. At least with releases like this where some of the game has to be downloaded, you can make the argument, well, at least this way I'm saving some space. Yeah, at this point you might as well just download both games. They might have also not put them both on the same cartridge considering they are technically two separate games. Nintendo updated the Switch later down the line to allow physical games to include multiple games in one, so when you insert the card, all the games pop up on the home screen. So if this released later, I'm sure they would have done that, but back in 2018, if they wanted both on the card, combining the two of them into one would have required Gasp developing a game select menu. I would have loved if they combined the two releases, called it Mega Man Ultimate Legacy Collection, but no, this is stupider, let's do that. At least Mega Man didn't get the Resident Evil treatment. Okay, first First off, Resident Evil Revelations Collection. Calling a pair of games a collection is kind of weird to me. Oh yeah, we got tons of games. Revelations, Revelations 2. But this follows the same trend. The first game's on the card, second game you have to download. Of course it's the bigger one. 26 fucking gigabytes. Come on. On Capcom, if you're gonna do this, at least have Revelations 2 be the one on the card. This game alone doesn't fit on a Switch without a micro SD card. If Revelations 1 was the download, that's at least only around 12 gigabytes. Just throw us a bone here. But man, this box like great. We do have the giant white banner disclaimer. I understand this for retail, but maybe just a sticker would do? Like, this is always here, even after I buy it. Oh, good to know. Both of these games, the game included on the game card, are games that have already gotten physical releases on Nintendo platforms before. The games that are digital only download codes have never been on a Nintendo platform prior, let alone physically. If they were gonna do this, I probably would prefer if they said, you know what, Mega Man Legacy Collection 1 already released on 3DS physically, let's give Legacy Collection 2 some time to shine if we have to pick one for the card. And you know, why not just release these games separately? They pulled the exact same shtick for other games in each of these series. Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 plus 2, oh, what a surprise. Resident Evil Origins Collection, Resident Evil Zero, the prequels on the card with Resident Evil Remake being the download. So I guess instead of doing the first game like with the other releases this time, they did the first game. Resident Evil Triple Pack, Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, and only 4 is on the card. At least the card doesn't say Resident Evil Triple Pack. That would have annoyed me if 4 was still the only one on there. At that point, wouldn't it have been nice to have reversible cover art for just Resident Evil 4 instead I get box art that looks like I'm packing chips for lunch? The download codes do last a while though, most of which which lasts roughly 800 years, give or take. That's good, anything less than 600, I would have flipped. You've got the games that require a download, like only your portions on the card. Ally Noir was like this, and I just said, I'll just download the whole thing. If I'm gonna have to download a good chunk of it, why bother with a card? I don't save a ton of space on my system, and I still have to grab the game and put it in my Switch. Mortal Kombat 11 did this too. Without the download, we can only play basic versus battles. However, that's kind of the main attraction, and this is a game that released on PS4 and Xbox One the exact day. I think the download requirement concessions are tolerable. But then they re-released Mortal Kombat 11 with the DLC included and got rid of the game card, like, 
What? Why not just have the game card from the original release, plus the download codes for the DLC? Now I need to have 32 gigabytes of free space. Doom on Nintendo Switch did a similar thing like with the original MK11 release. You had to download a portion of the game, but it was the online multiplayer, which just makes perfect sense. Not everybody was buying Doom for the multiplayer, and plus a lot of what makes these physical releases worth it is the fact these games are being basically preserved when they're put out like this. Doom's online multiplayer is obviously internet-based, so it's not gonna be alive forever regardless if it's included on the cartridge or not. So putting the single player there and having the multiplayer downloadable makes total sense. Releasing a box version of Fortnite does not. Which one should I get? Hmm. Apex Legends, why buy for free when buying for $30 is an option? These games are too popular for them to not release them at retail, but by being basically just online multiplayer and a free download, there's no point to putting them on a card. So they stuff these games fresh with download codes for some in-game purchases. I guess that's an incentive, but if these purchases are enticing you, you're probably already playing the game extensively. I feel like these releases appeal to people that have never played the games before. So what does legendary weapon skin mean to them? Overwatch got this treatment, coming with a three month Switch Online membership. Wow, what is that, like $4? Then we got Wolfenstein Youngblood and Call of Juarez. They just didn't want to f***ing do a card. For some reason, they both have different headers, which I will reiterate, these headers make me feel like a f***ing idiot. Uh... Oh wait, there's no game card? Youngblood, I kinda get. This is a standalone expansion to Wolfenstein 2, a game that already required a download on Switch, albeit coming mostly on a game card. So this probably wasn't gonna sell as well as that. Plus, it's 21 gigabytes. I'm not defending them doing this release. I think them just doing a standard digital one and nothing more would be perfectly fine. Call of Juarez requires four gigabytes. But you know it's bad when even Nintendo does it. Mario Kart Live Home Circuit comes in this giant box, no game card, not even a download code. It tells you, hey, just look it up. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, they gave it this amazing collector's edition only to have a download code. This could have used a physical release. I get Mario Kart to some extent, that game uses Wi-Fi to connect the toy card to your Switch, it might not function years down the line anyways, but Fire Emblem? That may sound like a broken record, but you're willing to do all of this but not this. It's expensive. I understand why not every game gets a physical release, but I just don't understand why some releases are treated like this, especially when the packaging is huge and they include all these other goodies or if the game is small enough to fit on a cartridge. And the strange thing is this doesn't work for other mediums. I bought hot dog buns and they just came with a rain check for buns. See, that just sounds fucking loony. Hey y'all, Scott here. Listen, I hate things and that includes clutter. Clutter scares the piss out of me, and I'm ready to get it out of my life ASAP and quickly. Jesus! You see, this is what I'm talking about. The whole concrete matter thing has been a fad for eons, and I'm ready to call it quits. I'm strictly living an all-digital lifestyle from this moment forward. I recently got rid of all my paper, and I'm currently in the process of converting all my movies, music, photos, clothes, water, trees, and documents to a hard drive. And this digitalization of my life extends to my video game collection as well. Just the mere thought of owning all these games physically makes me want to give myself a good old fist shaking. Ah, oh, it's amazing what it will be like when I own all these games digitally. Ugh, convenience alert. And to think I used to do this. No! What would I look like? Somebody who has time? That was the old me. New me only buys games digitally from now on. After getting rid of all unneeded physical items, I can now definitively say, this is what I'm talking about. All right, so let me start the digital renaissance. What game will I download first? Well, I love Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, so I'm gonna wanna play that again. All right, $29.99 is definitely a bit steep for a game I bought physically for $20 two years ago and that I can still buy physically for $20 or less. All right, well, maybe I should wait until I see a game I can get for the same price I bought for it physically or maybe even cheaper. In the meantime, I can play these games I downloaded on PlayStation Plus. Well, I have a hankering for Super Meat Boy. Oh, well, that's a hearty dose of disappointing. 
I don't own these games. I can only play them while my PS Plus membership is active. Totally whatever. It doesn't matter that my hard drive is basically full and I can't get games for cheaper digitally. What I can do is sign up for a streaming service, that being PlayStation Now. I signed up for a free trial a while back and it worked decently well. Back then, most of the games had different pricing and a game like Deus Ex Human Revolution would cost $30 to rent for 90 days while you could go out and buy a retail copy for $5 used. Now if you excuse me before I reenact what checking the prices of PlayStation Now was like back in 2015, I need to take a hearty gulp out of my hourly bottle of water. God, that's such tart water. And what gross prices? Now the service is much like Netflix as you pay an annual fee and you get access to hundreds of games. Much better in my opinion, but let's be honest here, streaming doesn't play well with a lot of games. I originally played Pac-Man Championship Edition DX on the service and it's really unenjoyable through streaming. The game requires pretty quick reactions, but with an online connection being required, that brings lag into play and it ends up kind of ruining the game. Digital games have recently disappointed almost every organ in my body, which is... unfortunate. The prices are generally higher than physical games, the storage space on these consoles are limited, and even if you buy an external hard drive, you can't really put that many games on it. Even a 2TB hard drive will fill up eventually because new games are so big. You can't even trade in the games, and you don't even technically own the games. You have a license to run the software, but you don't own it like you do with a physical copy of a game. You can do whatever you want after you buy it. That's not to say you're wrong if you like digital games, the convenience factor is definitely there, it's just, in my opinion, I just see much more benefits to owning physical games. But, we haven't tested out one more factor, download speed. So, we're gonna purchase Uncharted the Nathan Drake Collection on the PlayStation Store, see how long it takes to download, and we're gonna go to GameStop and buy the exact same game there, and bring it back home and see which one takes longer. Guys, don't mind me, just a member of the Economic Stimulation Squad here. Well, the download was faster than buying the game physically, and I can totally assure you that I am completely alive inside.